This video is just a short addition onto brakes history. So we're gonna look a little bit materials, but mostly we're gonna look at innovation in brakes. And the first thing we're looking at is block brakes. So we can see here we have a wooden wagon wheel that's steel rimmed with a wooden block brake. And the idea is that the steel rim holds the wheel together, um, but we always wanna be able to replace this block brake. So as, the, as you use the brake, it's gonna wear away at this block and the more uh, we use it, it's it's gonna wear and weigh. Uh, so we want this to be softer than the rim of the, the wheel because it's a lot easier to replace the block that we're using as a brake pad than it is to replace the rim of the wheel. Uh, same thing applies to trains. We can see here we have a metallic um, block and it's going up against the, uh, the steel uh, wheels of a train. Same thing here, we can see the lever um, in this picture. Let's see if we open it window. Um, zoom in that picture a little bit more, uh, but we can see the block being apl uh, being applied. It's directly, uh, but you can't use this. The what's the problem? Why we can't use this? Why why did block um, brakes uh, disappear? Yeah. Because they don't work on pneumatic tires. Exactly right. They don't work on rubber tires. Okay, so I have this um, song, Single Gun Theory Fall, uh, Gun Theory, and the song is called Fall. And it talks about how energy never dies, it just it changes form. That's the very first lyrics of the song. It's, I don't know if it's a great song or not, it's pretty old, um, but it's you know, one that stuck with me. But so the transformation that's taking place is we're going from kinetic energy or movement to heat via friction. Um, this picture here is, this is Bertha Benz. So she's the wife of Carl Benz, the guy who invented the Benz Patton motor wagon. And she's the first person to go on a long distance um, car drive. She drove from Mannheim to Florsheim with her two sons. I can't remember what the sons are called anymore, but um, she was, she uh, assisted in development of the Patton motor wagon. Um, at one point she couldn't go up a hill, so she had to get the boys to get out and push the car. And so she suggested to, to Carl that he had to put in a lower gear. Um, she was the first person to rig fill a car on the road. She bought some petrol from an apothecary. And so the old, world's oldest uh, petrol station is somewhere, you know, in the vicinity of Karlsruhe. Um, and that she could see that the block, um, the, the block brake that they were using was wearing away. So she went to a uh, shoemaker and she bought some leather and she applied some leather uh, to the, the brakes so that, that way she could replace the brake lining. Um, so she started, she left in, it's, these days it uh, is a 69 minute drive, but it took her all day from, uh, she left at dawn and arrived at dusk. So, um, and that probably would have been in summer, I'm, I'm betting. Uh, she, this was an important part of the success of the um, the Carl's Ben, the, the, the sorry, the, the Ben's Patton motor wagon, because Bertha was of the opinion that people wouldn't buy the car if they didn't understand the um, how it compared to a horse-driven carriage, and the idea of test drive. So she, this idea of test drives uh, came from Bertha Benz, um, saying that if she could do it, anyone could do it. Uh, okay. This, um, when we uh, went to rubber tires, so we have the Michelin, uh, I think, anyway, Michelin in France, we have Dunlop, I think, in Scotland. Um, so by 1888, uh, we started to have vulcanized rubber tires and you can't apply a block brake to those. So instead what they had is the contracting band brake. And I think this video gives a pretty good demonstration of the forces that are, it's not the video, this uh, GIF gives a pretty good, um, uh, it, it demonstrates the effect of the forces that are taking place on this brake and um, what generates the friction. So moving on, we then get to drum brakes, and I have a variety of different um, images for drum brakes. This one here, the, the, the return springs have been brightly colored so that we can more easily see, um, you know, to highlight them. But we, the idea is that we have two shoes. Um, I can't tell which one's the leading and trailing. I think this is the leading, because um, it looks bigger. Uh, there's also an adjuster on the bottom. The idea is that as the brake pads start to wear away, the adjuster will, uh, um, adjust in the application of the brakes and uh, to ensure that the time between braking doesn't increase or decrease as we start to wear out the brakes. Um, <clears throat> so here we have an expanded isometric drawing. And I think that, so I mean, the HSC is well aware of the, the idea of expanded isometric drawings as being a good way of visualizing what's going on in the brake. The idea is that um, 
this is connected to the wheel. This this part here is connected to the wheel, whereas the drum is connected to the car. And um, so the wheel is connected through the these threads on the, the hubcap. Um, so that's connected to the, the axle, whereas the drum is connected to the car. And that's where we're bringing those two things into to contact. Uh, generates friction. So we have a wheel cylinder. This wheel cylinder will fill up with, when we press the brake pedal, brake pedal, the brake fluid, which is incompressible, will displace. And uh, by being, it, when it's displaced, it will push these two pistons out on either side. Those pistons will then push this um, brake shoe against the wall of the drum and cause a friction, causing the vehicle to stop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's have a look at some other pictures we've got here. So here we just have another um, an isometric assembled picture. So we can see the brake lining, the brake shoe, the, dr the drum. Here we can see the drum on the outside. So it looks a bit more like when it's being assembled. Oh, um, this picture here is relates to a YouTube video. So um, the link is there. Um, so yeah, just this is the link here. Um, but that shows that it, I, I think that being able to see it being assembled, I think really helps you to visualize what's going on. Um, okay, and we have another exploded picture I, uh, from a different angle. I don't think there's really anything that we're more interested in here. We can see maybe a little bit more inside the, the wheel cylinder. We can see the pistons, but nothing too much more that we want to focus on. Now, we didn't always have wheel cylinders, and um, we didn't always have wheel cylinders because prior to using brake fluid, we had mechanical um, linkages. And so the idea is in this case is that we just had a spring that when um, the force was applied, it would twist the twist this, um, I, I guess we can call it an actuator here, that would that would cause the, um, it, it gives us an idea of the same concept happens, except now we're using the brake fluid to expand rather than this um, actuator. Okay, and so this gives us a, um, a visualization throughout the entire process. From, we can see when the brake is pressed that the, um, the brake fluid is displaced. The master cylinder gives us uh, um, the mechanical advantage of Pascal's principle and the, the expansion in the wheel cylinder. So we can see this in section now, the, the wheel cylinder expanding causes the uh, shoes to press against the walls, the, the drum rolls. Okay, um, just more, I mean, we really have, we're, we're, we're spoilt for choice in terms of our visualizations. And this drawing, I only use this as a reference for your uh, assessment task to say that the essentials I need to see is that you need to label the drum wall, the drum shoe, and um, then non-essential is things like uh, return spring, servo assist, um, the hydraulic brake fluid. Uh, what I we'll use this as a non-example, so, so what not to do. Don't have them extended or lopsided like that, totally out of scale and the, your curves should be uniform. I also, I think I only took, well, Mr. Um, Elsner marked it this year, but I think only one student I saw lost marks for feathering for their drawings, but that's something that I, I do try to keep an eye on. Okay, so uh, in terms of that, we can see here that um, that same process of the piston, the uh, wheel cylinder and its pistons being um, pressed out and brought into contact with the, the drum. Okay, as we go next, we've got, this is an expanded uh, disc brake. So we can see the um, calipers, uh, well, the, the pads that are here that are gonna be connected to the calipers. That's, <clears throat> let's have a look at, so we've got some visualizations. I'm just going to open them all at once and we'll just look at all of them through one or two cycles. Okay. So um, 
It's actually hard to notice, but we can see here the, um, the brake fluid pushing the piston against the uh, calipers, which is then applying force to the rotors, rotors then create that force then creating friction. So it's, it's a fairly minor change, but it's taking place here. So here we can see again that we're pushing on uh, the pedal. The pedal um, displaces fluid in the master cylinder. That gives us mechanical advantage through Pascal's principle. And that's applying. Here we can see that there's two cylinders, one on each side. That's not always the case. Um, so here we just see one one moving um, one moving brake pad that as the fluid fills up it's applying force and it's causing it to slow down um, yeah just the same thing here we can see pistons on both sides but here we can see the venting in between the advantage of venting is allows for exactly right heat dissipation is exactly the answer I'm looking for okay so here we can see the same thing here this this um, cylinder expanding the brake fluid um, pushing it now we were all the examples we're looking at are, have um, hydraulic brake lining so that's where a incompressible hydraulic fluid is what is dissipating the the force but um, or it is yeah um, we have also saw, we also mentioned the one example of a mechanical brake um, application, but also in your assessment task, what did you what was the alternative that you learned about alternative to hydraulics? Brake by, by wire, excellent. I wasn't even thinking about that one when I asked that question. But what's your? There's another alternative for heavy vehicles. We use air brakes. Air brakes. What's the advantage of air brakes? Yeah, even if there's uh, there's leaks, we, it will still break. Um, so here we, I think this picture is not much more to say. We, we've we've now just dis discussed most of the the functions. Um, so here we can see the master cylinder. So that as the brake pedal is being pressed, that that is displacing the um, the brake fluid in the master cylinder, and that's giving some mechanical advantage. And we can then see that being applied, the fluid filling up in the uh, the cylinder there. Okay, so uh, we've covered drum and disc brakes with all of those examples. Hopefully they're somewhat worthwhile. I've tried to pick ones that you know I thought were pretty good. Like I said, we're not really spoiled for choice. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is ABS. And so I've got the Wikipedia article, um, but uh, I think I have discussed ABS already to some extent in my video because, I mean, that's why I have that picture of... Um, Imperial Assault, the, oh, sorry, Re Rebel Assault? Rebel Assault was the name of the, the, the video game. That um, I was once uh, nearly in an accident um, when I was driving on a gravel road and I had lost control of the car and I started to fishtail. So I'm not sure why these links aren't opening. So my apologies. Um, fishtailing. I'm just going to try switching to a hotspot and see if that helps. Okay, so fishtailing is when um, when we lose control of the car. There's a tendency to go from uh, to go from to either side of the road, um, back and forth. So that that, that that's called fishtailing. Um, we'll just show that again because so the car is going back and forth so it was what was happening to me this was happening at you know 80 kilometers or more an hour on a gravel road <clears throat> And uh, there's, that's a, a risk that with ABS is that because it won't lock up, it, gravel roads really need you to lock up in order to generate enough uh, friction to, to slow down. Um, <clears throat> so I've got this video on um, understanding ABS and uh, it's, it's a pretty reasonable video. Actually, we're gonna skip to um, uh, 
three minutes into the video where the thing, so the idea of ABS is that ABS um, is a computer system, an automated system that will apply the brakes off and on. Du -du 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 -du. Uh, you can actually hear when your ABS um, comes on. And the advantage of this is that by applying the brakes over and over again, you're going to have better braking. Even on a straight, dry road, you're going to get more effective braking by releasing the brakes because we have brake fade um, and where the brakes cease to, they, they don't provide as much friction the longer you hold it down without ABS. But <coughs> what I thought was quite worthwhile as men mentioning is that with an ABS uh, brakes, it also helps you in an inconsistent surface. So if there's only puddles, if, if you drive through a puddle only on the, the left-hand side of the car, or the right-hand side of the car, whatever the case might be, is that the car, the wheels will slip relative to each other. And when the car, when the wheels slip relative to each other, it means that you're going to get that fish tailing and you, you're going to have generate torque and that torque is going to cause you to, uh, to fish tail. Well, not, 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 is not to fish tail, but just to, uh, to, to twist. So let's, there we go. <clears throat> so the idea is that by having um, ABS, it will apply the brakes. The, the brakes are being applied more heavily on the side that is dry compared to the side that is wet. And so that's another advantage of ABS is that it can vary the amount of braking on each wheel. So it's not just about timing and about applying the brakes off and on, but also about um, applying the brakes in order to prevent um, spinning out of control. Okay, so that is that picture. Uh, this, uh, and, uh, someone, I just saw this on the internet one day and I thought that it wasn't a bad picture. The idea is that by, I mean, in this particular case, I think it's ironic that this dog, the dog that has, um, using an ABS style is, is actually being pulled closer into the water than the one that's not. Um, but the idea is that by this dog, by rather than just plowing his feet in, but by stepping, you're more likely to be able to have a controlled stop. You'll be able to both control your steering and slow down and also just brake in a sl with less stopping distance. Okay, um, I always think it's worthwhile to mention that what to do if your brakes go out. So um, the first thing you should do is turn on your hazard so people know there's a problem. Um, your brake lights are attached to your brakes so that it's a possibility that the cars behind you won't know that you're braking. So you might go to all this trouble of, um, of braking and then get rammed up the back. Um, it's also worth mentioning that Toyota was plagued with um, with a with claims that their brakes didn't work. Uh, it turns out that it was probably people pressing the wrong pedal, right? That that's um, uh, various people, including Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, he sort of led a the journalist side of the idea that this these accidents were, were almost always inexperienced drivers, older drivers, people who were in unfamiliar cars. And one of the conclusions is that, well, it's possibly people who are just pressing the wrong brake pedal. Um, so the very first thing is, after you put, put on your hazards, is take your foot off the pedal and just apply the, the brakes again. There's a much better chance that you're going to hit the brakes the, the correctly the second time round. Whereas the first time round, if you just keep pushing your foot harder, you, you might actually be pushing the gas and in your panic, not realize you're actually pressing the accelerator and not the, not the brake. Okay, so the next thing is you should shift into a lower gear. Even if you're in an automatic, there's still lower gears that you can um, that you can usually use. Then you can apply the uh, handbrake or the make your car smell a smell bad lever. And then in an emergency, we're now getting to like higher and higher levels of emergency. Is you can try to slow down your car by instead of generating friction between uh, the brake pads and your wheels but between um, the guardrail and your car. Obviously, you would only do this in a real emergency because it's a dangerous maneuver. Not only is it gonna damage your car, but it's, it's a dangerous maneuver. And <clears throat> finally, pick, if you're gonna crash, you wanna pick a safe place to crash. So you wanna try and pick somewhere that's level rather than going down a big um, incline. Um, and yeah, you, you wanna avoid trees. So, um, <clears throat> That gets us talking about air brakes. Now, the terminology I use in class is I use the term air brake because you know I, I'm a big believer in Wikipedia being a good uh, authority. Though people use a lot of different terms. They use the term Jake brake um, because the first car company to use it was Jacobs. And uh, it's a fairly complicated uh, technology. There's advantages and disadvantages. You guys have already done this for your report, so you will uh, have already had some, some take on it. but. Um, 
Yeah, they're sometimes also called engine brakes or compression braking. I'm using the term air brake after a lot of consideration. The problem is that air brakes also have other connotations, particularly in aviation, the idea that we can just, when you lift up a panel that creates a, a surface that to slow you down um, because of air resistance rather than what we we're talking about here. But that said, the, um, that's the terminology I'm using. I'm, I'm following along with, uh, with um, Wikipedia. Okay, so there's some advantages and disadvantages. One of the big things we talked about is that it has much safer, right? That if there is a leak, we're, we're not gonna have a problem because the these brakes are applied always on and the, we have to actually release the brakes in order to drive the car. So in order to release the brakes, we have to fill the uh, the chamber with compressed air, and that's uh, so the brakes are on by default. Um, there are some downsides. Otherwise, would every every car would use these? Why do, doesn't every car use these? Well, because they're generally more expensive. They're generally very large. So on your small, you know, two two da, um, two door coupe, you know, you're probably not going to want to have these big brakes. Whereas if you've got a semi trailer, if you've got a um, a B double, you're probably going to be happier to have these big this big piece of equipment. It also requires specific training. And then there's the element, the concern of noise. And so we're going to finish off this video, I think. Um, I think this is the last thing. We're going to see um, a Jake brake noise pollution. So it's the sound that gets made by uh, these brakes. Let me just check that there's nothing else after this. Oh, no, we're going to talk about regenerative brakes. Okay, never mind. So uh, people say it often sounds like a machine gun, um, but often brakes are instructed not to use, sorry, drivers are instructed not to use their um, air brakes or their engine brakes in uh, residential areas. I think the regenerative brakes, uh, nope, still got more, one more after that. Oh, still got a couple more, okay. That's wrong, that should be PN3. Okay, so now, now we're gonna go into regenerative brakes. Regenerative brakes are what we use typically in hybrid cars and in electric cars. The reason for that um, is because we're gonna be generating electricity and we need to store that electricity in a battery. And if we can't use that battery for anything, then it's not gonna be uh, all that effective. So we wanna use car, uh, the, the regenerative brakes are used in cars that uh, have in, uh, sorry, electric motors, in, either in addition to or instead of um, internal combustion engines. So I've got two links here, and I don't think I'm gonna go into them. I think that they're things that need to be sort of looked at standalone. These, again, you, you, I'm talking to a class who's just done their assessment task, but it's important to remember that um, This, the simple concept that we want to look at is that electricity is, sorry, kinetic energy, instead of being converted into heat, is being con converted into, uh, into electricity. And this is the first introduction we have into electric motors, the concepts of, um, we have the, the rotor and stator and how we're, we're generating, um, and also for generators. I, yeah, I won't go into these videos, but I think that I, I looked at a few before I came up with those ones, and I think they're, they're pretty reasonable explanations. Okay, so here we can see the brake linings. So this is the brake lining on a drum brake, and this is the drum, the lining on a disc brake. Both of these, you can see, contain asbestos. And um, the in terms of asbestos law in Australia, I have a link here that... Um, Uh, 2003 is when asbestos was banned in Australia. Uh, I remember, oof, definitely in the 2000s, there was a truck company and it had a recall because in its um, engine, uh, some, I think uh, some sort of valve or hose contained a small amount of asbestos and you could get that part recalled. Um, and it was a really cheap car company and that definitely affected them. Uh, it's So it says here, although Australia has only one third of the UK's population, we have a similar number of deaths as to the UK. I worked with a guy and his wife worked in um, hazardous substance removal, basically asbestos, and she could not believe how bad the asbestos problem was in Australia. And, I mean, obviously it's a third, as, uh, three times as bad. Um, CSR and James Hardy are two companies which are both um, had 
uh, problems in terms of litigation re relating to the use of asbestos. Not so much for, for brakes, but for, um, for compressed fibre sheets, and known as fibro. And if you ever work in rail, uh, or at least when I worked in rail, we basically treat the entire rail corridor as having asbestos because all of those trains had used asbestos in their brake lining and we can't guarantee that uh, um, across the, the rail network that there's going to be as, as trace amounts of asbestos. Okay, I've still got one more. I think we've got to finish on um, different kinds of brake pads. And maybe not with this class, but with the other class, I went through the year 12 notes just so I wanted to introduce the concept of sintered metal composites. So sintering is a process where we can, also known as powder metallurgy or powder forming, that we can use to make, um, that we, we, we use sintering as, as a process to in when we use alumina. So things like um, spark plugs are made out of alumina where they can be, they're, they're formed together under a lot of pressure and then heat is applied and that, that allows the setting of the materials. In the specific case where we have, um, <clears throat> I, I, won't, I won't read through this, but this is from the textbook. So this is the year 11 textbook, um, but we can talk about, so some pads are made with no medical, metal, metal particles. Copper is often added to improve heat dissipation because um, copper has both good electrical and thermal conductivity. Um, so we use uh, alumina and Kevlar to resist fake brake, fa brake fade. I mentioned that earlier. Um, manufacture of modern brake linings. So these days where we used to use asbestos as the fibers, we now, uh, well, okay, we still use the same resin. The matrix that holds the thing together is um, phenyl formaldehyde resin. This is the same material as Bakelite, or it's a very similar uh, material to Bakelite, but phenyl formaldehyde is a thermosetting polymer. We've talked about that as an example. It's in specifically its structures in the textbook. Heat is applied um, to promote polymerization of the resin. Once it is res... Uh, such as the steel plate or shoe. Um, yeah, but so to give the, we use the Kevlar or the nylon or the polyamide fibers and they replace the asbestos fibers and that, that provides tensile strength in the, in the composite material. Okay, um, now this is the, from the year, year 12 book on powder forming. So this is for sintered metal composites. This is for metal, metal composites typically. So we're just gonna look at these three steps. Well, I'm not gonna read out the rest of it. We're just, we're just introducing the concept. We're gonna revisit it again next year. But if we look at the three steps, the first step shows that uh, the particles, the powder is in a free state. Um, step two is that we cold weld the metals um, by pressing them together. And then we heat at, uh, does it give a temperature? I did read this recently. I think it, I read that it was 1500 degrees, so 1500 degrees, to, probably definitely it depends on the materials you're using. But what happens is that the atoms within the metals will actually transfer between grain boundaries so that we can actually see a transfer of material across grain boundaries and that it actually fuses. Now, why do we use powder forming? What is the purpose? Um, uh, in this case, it allows us to join metals that otherwise won't alloy. That's the, that's the, the reason why it was first developed. I think it was so that we could, um, so, so we could fuse platinum and tungsten, I think was the first application. Uh, don't quote me on that. That's not something quite you'll ever, I'll ever put an exam. But so tungsten, uh, if we want to have something that's very hard and conductive, so we might use a copper tungsten. Uh, we can't make a co copper tungsten alloy, but what we can do is instead is we can fuse it as a powder, uh, using powder forming. Um, also tungsten has very, very high m melting point, uh, m higher than most um, furnaces. So that's why we, we will often use powder forming in that process. Uh, the other advantage is, is that because there's still some holes, it's porous, so it can be self-lubricating. Also, it gives very fine finish, so we don't need to machine it, so we can produce something that's ready to go. So the example I always use is Happy Mill Toys. If we're making a gear for a car, we're gonna machine that gear. 
right? Because we need that gear to be really strong. It needs to not break when we go over a pothole. Whereas if we're talking about a Happy Meal toy, well, the thing that matters is that it's cheap. And we don't want to have to machine a... Uh, a gear that is five millimeters, 10 millimeters in diameter. We want to just have that be pressed into shape. And we don't really care if it's not strong enough to support the weight of a one ton car over a pothole. It just needs to hold a you know 30 gram Happy Meal toy. So they're the key reasons that when we talk about um, powder metallurgy, also known as sintering. Sintering is actually the last stage. The is when we apply heat to uh, allow material to transfer from one grain to the other grain uh, across grain boundaries but the terms can be used interchangeably powder forming and, and sintering okay um i think that is oh we've still got one more yeah so products so porous complex articles so things that are very difficult complex shapes that we don't want to have to machine um and then it says machining composites that are uh, so alloys that we can't use it says copper and tungsten and disadvantages it's not very strong okay so that covers the materials component i just want to say that for the sake of the assessment task this is an example from a question 2015. it's unlikely that in the hsc you'll get questions on breaks it's not to say that it's impossible so this um i think this visualization i mean we saw lots and lots of visualizations but this i think is interesting and it shows the three parts of the assessment task we just did we have the pedal we have our master cylinder and then we have the brake supplying friction and so this is the standard that i talk about i've all gone i have another video where i've gone into a lot of detail about what you should do for your assessment task but this is uh, the leverage that's being applied. Now, this leverage is pretty simple. It's, uh, it's flat. If it's at an angle, I'm going to give more marks. So that means that you're not going to get full marks by demonstrating this. Also, I deliberately, when I show these on the board, maybe not in this case, but when I write these up on the board, I deliberately um, choose values for coefficients of friction, for forces that are unrealistic. So that way, the students who provide me with realistic values for coefficient of friction, students who say, I've used the value of 0.45 because you know I read it in this textbook, those students are going to get better marks. Um, and then we have Pascal's principle, which is um, applied during the, at the master cylinder. And then we have friction. Now, in this case, we haven't talked about where those values have come from, so the transfer of forces. Obviously, this is a simplification. There'd be very few cars that only have one brake pad. So um, that you know, only have one uh, brake disc attached to a car. So that a student who dem who breaks up their their forces in a more realistic uh, force distribution. So, for instance, I've even had students who talk about the fact that more force might be applied to the front wheels instead of the rear wheels. If you're going to make that claim, you need to support that. You need to show where the reference comes from. Otherwise, I can't give you additional marks. But these are the sorts of things that I'm looking at, that this is why I tend to give most students um, no more than an eight, and it's only students who have really gone the extra mile. This is the area that I tend to mark the most harshly in the assessment task. Okay, so that's um, my additional notes on breaks. And um, yeah, hopefully that's of some benefit.